Hi, this is Peter Beal. In this second lecture, we're going to cover, again, a very quick survey of the history of art from roughly the fall of Rome, uh, just in terms of chronology. So say from roughly the 5th century or so CE um, until about 1300 CE. Um, some, I think, might appropriately describe this uh, as the age of faith. We see the emergence of a number of important world religions uh, on the world stage, especially Hinduism and Islam, and certainly the flowering Christianity in the West in the medieval period. Let's get started with this really quite remarkable monumental Buddha uh, right around the time, actually, contemporary with the fall of Rome. This is in the later period of the 5th century and gives a good indication of the um, widespread distribution of Buddhism, the uh, emergence of Buddhism, particularly to the north of India uh, in China. Um, again, a spectacularly large uh, sculpture cut into the live stone in uh, far off in the west of China, a really spectacular instance of the transmission of Buddhism. And a good example of the architecture of Islam is seen in the famous Dome of the Rock, and this is later in the eight, uh, seventh century, uh, Islam being started in the, earlier in the seventh century. Islam, of course, by the middle, say, of the ninth century, has come to dominate most of what we, today we would call the Middle East, and in fact, much of the uh, former Roman Empire to the south and uh, to the east and along the coast of Africa is under the control of Islam. If we look at the Dome of the Rock, we can see remarkable uh, similarities to slightly earlier Byzantine structures, uh, you know, further to the east in Constantinople and elsewhere, and a great reliance on the use of um, calligraphy as an ornament and tile, of course. This is a very sacred uh, structure in a very sacred place and remains so to this day. In the west, uh, in the region of uh, Italy in particular, the Roman Empire adopts Christianity by the middle of the 4th century, and we see a number of striking architectural uh, uh, monuments to attest to that. Sonica Costanza is a good example. Uh, this is um, uh, in Rome, the city of Rome, of a, a central plan uh, church. Really, it's intended to be a kind of... Um, uh, funerary or, or baptism type uh, structure. This gives one example of the way in which Christian architecture went. The other, uh, of course, is the basilica style, a little more with a longitudinal nave, and this is uh, very um, dominant going forward in terms of Christian architecture. Both are adopted from uh, Christian uh, formats, sorry, Roman formats and pre-Christian formats, and uh, are adapted to Christian use. The tendency in uh, early medieval, if we use that term, pictorial art is to begin to dispense with the conventions that are typical of the Greco-Roman heritage, which is to say a focus on the effects of light and shade, naturalistic posing of uh, human bodies, obvious depiction of narrative, uh, a sense of space. These tend to be uh, discarded over the centuries. And a good example of this happening is in the art of the Byzantine Empire, as you can see with these mosaic uh, images, mosaic panels from uh, San Vitale uh, in Ravenna, which is about as far west as the Byzantine Empire really goes in uh, the 6th century. So Justinian attends, this is, by the way, directly adjacent to the altar area at the Church of San Vitale. Um, Justinian attends uh, Mass along, most remarkably, with his uh, wife, Theodora, who bears the chalice. These mosaics are gorgeous and very colorful, but again, emphasize those qualities of two-dimensionality and a certain lack of naturalism. If we look at one of the most spectacular pro uh, productions of Justinian, that's the Hagia Sophia, which is uh, going up in the 530s. Here we see a view of that expansive central dome that appears to be suspended on air. We get a good sense of the priorities in Byzantine architecture, again, on that central dome. And the use of mosaic to decorate the structure. We have uh, some remnants of this with the fall of Constantinople in 1453 to uh, Muslim forces. A lot of the mosaic and other types of internal decoration were lost as this was turned into a mosque. But we still have a few traces. And the so-called diasis mosaic depicting Christ gives us a good idea of the way in which uh, Byzantine art uh, uh, 
especially portraying the human figure, was done. It preserves some of those aspects of uh, Roman art and indeed is important for Renaissance art uh, going forward into the uh, 14th and 15th centuries. As I mentioned, the spread of Islam is rapid and uh, very important for the trajectory of world history. We start seeing spectacular mosques, Islamic houses of worship, a good example of which is the Great Mosque of Damascus from the early 8th century. And the ornament inside these mosques is, uh, can be quite spectacular. A good example of a mirab, a niche that points the way to Mecca from Isfahan in the 14th century gives us a sense of the use of intricate geometrical ornament and calligraphy, avoiding the use of figurative art in uh, ornamenting or decorating a church, repeating and complex architectural patterns reflecting some of that geometry we saw in the previous mirab are present in the mosque at Cordoba, again dating from the 8th into the 10th century, and uh, stands out, I think, as a typical uh, um, characteristic of Islamic art, abstract ornamental pattern. Sense of pattern is also present in um, what we'd have to describe as very early uh, so-called barbarian art, uh, the, the art of medieval Europe in the north. So this purse cover from Sutton Hu, dating from the early uh, 7th century, relies heavily on uh, what's often described as animal interlace. You can see that in the upper central uh, portion, what appears to be snakes biting each other. Complex uh, interlace, abstracted patterns, and emphasis on bright colors and precious materials are typical of this uh, sort of pre-Christian, uh, really many ways pre-European, so-called barbarian or Hiberno-Saxon art. Some of these motifs find their way, as this region becomes Christianized, find their way into illuminated manuscripts. So we have an example here from the image of St. Matthew from the Lindisfarne Gospels showing a reliance on flat two-dimensional patterning, patterning and uh, that again that sense of linear uh, interlace that dominates uh, ornamental aspects of the bench that Matthew's sitting on or those motifs at each corner of the picture frame. If we look at a, a, <clears throat> an illuminated manuscript from a hundred years later this from the Gospel Book of Charlemagne in the early 9th century, we can see that this artist has chosen instead to rely on the legacy of Greco-Roman antiquity in creating model figures, even Roman dress, in a typical sort of a stance that we might expect uh, a Roman writer, scholar, intellectual uh, to take, and is indicative of the kind of persistent transmission of classical antiquity in visual terms. The so-called Romanesque period emerges in European art around the year 1000, and we see it uh, spectacularly emerging in church architecture and decoration. A good example of this is in Giselbertus's Last Judgment from the Cathedral at Autun, where he shows Christ sitting uh, in judgment, uh, surrounded by dozens and dozens of characters, uh, souls being uh, raised up to heaven or condemned to everlasting hell in a very spectacular and expressive fashion. The Gothic is perhaps the most famous instance of medieval art uh, to the, to, in terms of general knowledge. And as we look at the West Facade of Chartres Cathedral, uh, we begin to see some of the tendencies toward uh, immense vertical, uh, richly ornamented uh, churches, uh, sites for sculpture, and of course, as this picture indicates, the uh, extensive use of stained glass. If we look, for instance, at the cathedral at Reims in, the, in northern France, we can see the degree to which that facade has been transformed in about a hundred or so years to an extraordinarily complex uh, a sense of, of a frame that's going to be filled in with sculpture and stained glass and the sort of dissolution of the wall I think is very critical. And the other thing that begins to emerge in the Gothic period is uh, a greater sophistication in terms of sculptural uh, techniques and the depiction of the human form as we begin to see here in the Visitation and Annunciation sculptures, again on the facade at Rheim. There's a real sense of articulating figures in a Roman style, and a certain sense, especially with the angel on the far left, of beginning to manipulate these characteristics for expressive effects. This sort of sense of elegance and delicacy that's typical of the late Gothic period is evident here. In Asia, some interesting things are beginning to happen, especially the ascendancy of, of Hinduism, and we see this manifest 
in any number of ways. Uh, obviously, the visual arts is what we're focusing on. So the depiction of the Shiva Nataraja uh, bringing the universe into being and then destroying it again is a, is a great example of the refinement and elegance of Indian art as we come into the 11th century. And there is a bewildering assortment of gods and their incarnations depicted in sculpture and painting. And to take an example in terms of architecture, if we look at the Khandariya Mahadeva uh, temple from Kajuraho, this temple, as are many others of its time in the 11th century, decorated with a bewildering array of spectacular carvings, all kinds of subjects. In uh, China, the uh, stupa that we saw with the great stupa Sanxi has been elevated, uh, made much more vertical in the form of a pagoda and uh, is, again, a very characteristic uh, Chinese form. In landscape painting, the Chinese made remarkable uh, images indeed. This is a great example by Guo Zhi of early spring. Really, if you would compare it to the West, certainly many, many uh, years ahead in terms of the focus on landscape in any kind of naturalistic uh, direction, the sense of evoking natural forces of the intersection of, of rocks and water that certainly would be the heart, say, of a Taoist understanding of nature is beautifully depicted here. In Japan, uh, very interesting things are happening. The focus on wooden architecture reaches, reaches a sort of spectacular crescendo in the 8th century with the Todaiji Temple in, in Nara, uh, again, Japan, 8th century. And very interestingly enough, for the pictorial arts, the Japanese a painting style, though borrowing to some degree from Chinese uh, instances. Uh, this example here of the night attack on the Sanjo Palace gives us a sense of A, the political conflict of its time. Again, we're in the now we're moving into the 1200s and 13th century, but also the particularly dynamic and um, I almost want to say aggressive style of Japanese art in conveying this expressive and uh, active sense. In the next lecture, we'll uh, begin to tackle uh, the story of art from roughly the early 14th century through the uh, 17th century.